Well, good morning. Great to see you all this morning. Welcome to those of you that are joining us from home as well. Glad to be able to worship together as God's people, either in person or in disparate locations. We are united by Christ and his spirit as we gather together for worship. Uh, one note for you, particularly for those of you at home, the bulletin that we will be working off of, as it were, this morning, you can find at harvestpres.com slash sermons, harvestpres.com slash sermons. Uh, there's a PDF of the bulletin available for you there so that we can all stay quite literally on the same page. Uh, for all of us, uh, just one brief announcement, and that is about Thursday evening, this coming Thursday evening, our Lessons and Carol service beginning at 6 p.m. Uh, we are going to have that service here live in the sanctuary in person with our normal COVID protocols in place, um, but also we will be live streaming that uh, on our Facebook page at 6 p.m. If you'd rather stay home, uh, you can still join in that worship service uh, Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Historically, in the past, we've had a fellowship meal after our Lessons and Carol service. No fellowship meal this year, um, but uh, service will be from 6 to about 7, maybe a little bit shorter than that, and then we can uh, all be on our way and enjoy our Christmas with family, Lord willing. As we move toward uh, our worship service now, this morning, I want to draw our attention to page 2 of our bulletin. There you see a, a hymn that is a, a rather ancient text it has been translated helpfully for us into English so that we don't have to sing it in Latin. Um, but for uh, this morning for us, it will serve as, a, as an invocation, as a, a prayer. It kind of sets our service uh, apart as something different, uh, where we, God's people, gathering in Jesus' name, come together and look to him by faith, requesting his aid and presence and help. So we will sing together, Come Thou Redeemer of the Earth, as a corporate invocation. And as we sing and pray, we can remain seated as we enter into worship together. Redeemer. Come thou Redeemer of the earth and manifest thy virgin birth. Let every age adoring fall. Such birth befits the God of all. Begotten of no human will, but of the Spirit thou art still the Ah. Uh. 
and Holy Spirit evermore. As we're able, let's stand together and we'll call one another into worship. I'll read the light print. Please respond together with the bold. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping a covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Who, Who is, is a God, God like, like you? you? Let's sing together number 221, the red hymnal there in the pew rack. 221, Lo, how a rose air blooming. Our weakness, no, 
bring us at length, we pray, to the bright courts of heaven, and to the endless day. What is worship without a few surprises? We have a reading again from God's word, Psalm 71. And let's read this together. This is the word of God. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. O oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you. Amen. Please be seated. Will you pray with me? I've been this week reading in my quiet time from Matthew chapter 2, where the wise men go to Jerusalem searching for the Christ child. I'll use that as my guide for prayer this morning. But please pray with me. Our Father and our God, we read your word and it is so uh, beautiful and interesting. It is so full of surprises and wonder. We think about the wise men coming to Jerusalem after a long, long journey searching, searching for the new king. Father, please give us a desire in our hearts that we sincerely want to be with the Lord Jesus, our king and that we'll search for him every day with all our heart. It must have surprised those wise men to arrive in Jerusalem. I think they must have expected the city to be in a festival, decorated and bright and excitement in the streets because the king had been born. But there seems to have been no expectation. There seems to have been no uh, eagerness and delight in the arrival of the king. You have warned us, Lord, that when you come back, it might be that there is no faith on the earth. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Lord, please don't let us be blind and uninterested. We live in a dark world. We live in a dark country where the birth of Christ has been transformed into a, a very worldly, materialistic event. We live in secular times, and there is oftentimes no welcome for the gospel of your grace. Lord, please have mercy on our land and on our nation and on our people. Thank you that you spoke to Gentile men and women and brought them in a caravan to Jerusalem. Thank you that you brought them before the tyrannical ruler of that city and that region. Thank you that as he lied to them, you protected them and they were not deluded. When he said, search diligently for the child so that I too may go and worship him. Father, we live in a, in a nation awash in lies, 
Deliver us from evil, please. Deliver us from delusion. Deliver us from deception. Deliver us from cooperating with those who would tyrannize and make mockery of the things of God. Deliver us from evil. Your providential care of the wise men, wise men is amazing, Lord, that they were not led astray, but they were delivered. Your providential care is amazing in that Herod didn't send someone to accompany them to the child. You protected the Lord Jesus in that situation. Protect the work of your hands in our situation and deliver us, Lord, and bring us through that we may serve you and that we may truly worship you. Thank you, Father, that the plan and the purposes of your kingdom endure forever and reach back into eternity past. Thank you that this child who was to be born was uh, the leader from the ancient of days, the leader who had been leading and working and accomplishing your will all uh, the way back into eternity past. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Thank you that when the wise men came to the place where Mary and Joseph were staying, that they felt rejoicing with exceeding great gladness. Lord, even though we have not seen Jesus, we believe in him with joy inexpressible. Give to us, Lord, more and more of that joy in Christ. Give to us joy and gladness for who you are and how worthy you are. And let us come to you, dear Savior. Let us come to you and bow and worship to you. Give to us, Lord, your rich fellowship and communion in worship here but all week long and everywhere we go, give us a heart of worship that you may be our God and that we may be your people gladly, willingly following you. These things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, these things we pray in your triune name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Continuing our way through the latter portion of Isaiah's prophecy, chapters 40 to 66, we currently are in chapter 44, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8, you find that on page 604 of the Pew Bible, rolls over onto page 605, so I encourage you to have that open in front of you, either the Pew Bible or your copy of the scriptures and as you're turning to that passage, just a reminder to you about the, the context of these chapters. It can be difficult to just jump right into a text and not know why it's here and to whom it's written and when it was written. And so just a reminder of those couple of those details. God here in Isaiah 44, and indeed in the broader context of Isaiah 40 to 66, is speaking through Isaiah the prophet to his people, the nation of Israel, uh, about 600 BC. It's about 2,600 years ago. Uh, God is speaking to his people through Isaiah the prophet. Uh, now for hundreds of years before this prophecy and before this, this time in history, God had been patiently blessing his people so that they might know him and make him known so that they might be a blessing to others. But, but, but God's people were persistent in their rebellion and unfaithfulness despite centuries of God's mercy to them. Eventually, to discipline them for their stiff-necked rejection of grace and to refine them to more fully reflect his glory in the world, God delivers his own people up to captivity. 
He delivers them to the, the foreign nation of Babylon. And the Babylonians come in and they remove God's people from Jerusalem and the surrounding uh, towns and villages and ship them off about 900 miles to the east to Babylon. But even as they are being refined, God speaks. Even into the midst of their exile and uncertainty and even into the midst of the, the moments of discipline, God speaks a word of comfort to his people. Saying it won't always be like this. I have my reasons and I'm with you. And I will be with you. So the latter portion of Isaiah is 27 chapters of comforting promises from God to his people. That's the context of our text. And as we think more particularly about Isaiah 44, it might be helpful for us to acknowledge one of the great anxieties of our day, of any day, is what's going to happen with the next generation. Particularly as you get older, you begin to wonder about what legacy are you leaving? What impact has your life had? Will my children carry on either the family business? Will they carry on the, the faith? What's going to happen with the next generation? And in our day and in our culture more broadly, what with COVID created educational challenges, there are even questions about do we, are we creating a lost generation of children? What is the impact going to be of the COVID pandemic 20, 30, 50 years down the road? These are questions that are rolling around in our society, in our culture, maybe even in our own hearts and minds. What's going to come of the next generation? With all the challenges and the difficulties confronting us, will the next generation be okay? Same concerns were present in Isaiah's day and for his audience 2,600 years ago. But the good news of the scriptures is that though circumstances change, God does not. So let's give our attention to his word, Isaiah 44, 1 through 8. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, The Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we do ask for your added blessing to the reading of your word, that you might speak to us by your spirit, that our clogged up ears would be unclogged, and that our confused and cluttered hearts would become clear, and we might see you, and so that we might live as becomes your children, your witnesses, your delighted in ones. So help us by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
This is a beautiful passage. It's a beautiful passage that comes on the heels of some beautiful passages. (laughs) Reminder after reminder of God's purposes and his grace to us. You may remember, remember, however, that chapter 43 ended in some ways a little bit negatively because there God talks about punishment, punishment for sin. God is going to deliver Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. In some ways that was fulfilled in this season of exile and captivity that God's people were in. But even that pointed to a, a deeper, richer fulfillment that would come ultimately in the person and work of Jesus, who would fulfill the destruction and reviling that is promised here with his death on the cross. One of the challenge, one of the difficult pieces of the normally helpful insertion of chapter numbers and verse and versification, which wasn't there in the original, but our translators have put it there to help us. One of the challenges of that is you can sometimes miss the flow of the, of the, the speech or the sermon as it is here in Isaiah. So it might be helpful for us to back up to verse 28 of chapter 43 and read through the, the chapter demarcation. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel whom I have chosen. This connection with the previous passage helps helps us feel more the weight of verse 1. But now, but now, here, God is saying, yes, refining is happening. Discipline is ongoing. And I'm still speaking. God is still speaking to his people. He's not abandoned them to the refining fires. He's not abandoned them in Babylon. He continues to speak despite their experience of discipline, refinement, despite their experience of the wilderness and the desert, the uncertainty. There are things that are still true. But now, hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen, Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Listen to the the language that the Lord uses here in verse 2 to remind his people that he still has purposes for them. Look at the, the verbs. Thus says the Lord, so he is speaking now, the Lord who made you. You you are being refined, but it is God who made you. He who formed you from the womb and will help you. It is this Lord who has chosen you. The end of verse 2. We have to remember in the midst of hardship and difficulty of refinement and discipline that we have been by the Lord made, formed, chosen. Those are necessary reminders for God's people that what they're going through isn't meaningless. It's actually purposeful. God has purposes for his people that no pagan king, no global pandemic, no personal difficulty, no relational challenge can thwart. God has purposes and he is working them out. And that leads then to the command at the partway through verse 2, fear not. Fear not. God, the command to fear not is really a gracious comment. It's gracious in that it acknowledges the fear. For God to say to us, don't be afraid, lets us know that he knows that we're afraid. He sees us. He knows the fear, the the anxiety, the the uncertainty that we're living in, and he speaks into it. He's not detached and unaware. He's present and lovingly, purposefully present. Fear not. It's a gracious comment, and it it acknowledges our fear. (laughs) 
God acknowledges that, that fear might come and that given the circumstances, to a certain extent, it's understandable that one would be afraid. But by faith, we get to fight against that fear. The presence of fear, we don't have to submit to the fear. We can fight against it. And God equips us for how we do that. Here's how we fight against the fear. Remember that I formed you, God says. Remember that I made you. Remember that I have chosen you. To to bear that purposeful election in mind that God has made, formed, chosen, enables us to fight the fear of whatever the present circumstances are. We can't allow our understanding of the world to be principally driven by our current circumstances. We must allow God's speech to speak louder than any other speech. We must allow God's promises to be more powerful in our own hearts than any other words that we hear. The way that we fight fear, God tells us, fear not, for I have chosen you. We fight fear by remembering that we are made, formed, chosen by this God. And there's a second part to fighting fear as well, and we see that in verses 3 to 5. Not just what God has done in the past, formed, made, chosen, but also what God promises to do in the future. We've seen this same metric before in in the earlier chapters of Isaiah 40 uh, up to this point. We have to reflect upon and remember and ground ourselves in what God has done in the past while also acknowledging and receiving and resting upon what he promises to do yet in the future. And that's what we see also in verses 3 to 5. The promises of future grace. Fear not, for one, I have chosen you, but two, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among grass, among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand the Lord's and name himself by the name of Israel. God promises that he will continue to be present with his people, continue to be active in the world, drawing people to himself, satisfying weary and thirsty souls with himself by his spirit. And he promises to his covenant people who were in this context in exile in Babylon, 900 miles away from home and regular worship rhythms and patterns, he promises them, I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing upon your descendants. Before God's people were finally taken into exile, the Babylonians set siege around Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a walled city. And in those days, the way that you set siege was you just didn't let anybody in or out. And a walled city has limited resources inside the walls of the city. Eventually, the resources run dry. The food runs low. You can't get back out to the fields and bring in the crops. The the water resources could be shut off at the city walls. Eventually, water and food run out. And those that are still surviving in the city wind up burying loved ones who've passed away from starvation There are horribly gruesome details in the scriptures about what parents did with their children who passed away out of fear and hunger. 
And some of those parents who boiled their own children were taken into exile. Now you put yourself in that situation, a survivor, with all kinds of survivor's guilt. And how could you have done such a horrible thing? What will come of me? What will come of us? Here we are, hundreds of miles away from home, and think about what we have done. And to those people, God says, I will pour out my spirit on your descendants. The power of the promise of future grace not only weighs heavily on God's people, but it frees God's people. Because it tells us our mistakes, our failures, the most wretched things that we have done are no match for the power of the grace of God. I will pour out my spirit upon your offspring. There would have been those in exile who no longer had offspring. How can God fulfill a promise about offspring when there are those that have none? Well, because the context of the biblical story tells us that God's primary concern for his people is that they be a part of his family. God's primary concern is the covenant family, not the biological or nuclear family. Biological and nuclear families have a huge role to play in the kingdom of God. More on that in a moment. But God's primary concern is for the growth of his church, his kingdom, and that people would be brought into that family, adopted into it. And so we see in verse 5 this, this beautiful revival scene. People are coming to faith. They're, they're, they're entering into the family. They're owning God as their God. Calling themselves by the name Yahweh. See, we are more needy than we realize. And God is more gracious than we would dream. And God is always the, the one to supply. God is always the one to meet the need. God is the one who initiates. We are the ones who respond. We are the ones who respond to him and his promises and his grace. And so it's no surprise in this context of, of our need and God's initiating uh, action toward us and our response is no surprise that here into this context God speaks about his spirit for how else will we who are hard-hearted rebels how else would we own up to being the Lord's if it weren't by his spirit in us changing us changing our hearts of stone and making them hearts of flesh removing the wax from our spiritual ears so that we might hear and know that he is God. The role of the Holy Spirit is, uh, is on display here in the text that God will pour out his spirit on his covenantal children. This is not, not, a, not a foreign concept in the scriptures. Throughout the Old Testament, God speaks of his spirit, the, the, the spirit of God present uh, in the, uh, both in the creation uh, accounts, but also God's spirit present in the camp of his people as they were in, in the wilderness. God's spirit present with individual believers and in their experiences of repentance. See, like, for, uh, for example, Psalm 51. God's spirit promised even earlier in Isaiah chapter 32, verses 14 to 17. The palace is forsaken, the populous city deserted, the hill and the watchtower will become dens forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, 
and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness abide in the fruitful field. And the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation. The Spirit of God coming to the people of God to bring about the righteousness of God in this world. Later in the prophet Joel, we have one of the fuller uh, promises about the Old Testament, excuse me, in the Old Testament about the Holy Spirit, Joel chapter 2. Uh, God promises to pour out his spirit on, on, uh, on God's people such that sons and daughters come to faith and are, and are speaking a good word for God. In John's Gospel, chapters 14 to 16, Jesus tells us that when he leaves, when he ascends and goes back to the Father, he's not going to leave us as orphans, but he's going to send us the helper, the comforter, his own spirit to be with us, to abide in us so that we might abide in him. And in Luke chapter 24, some of Jesus' last words to his disciples, Luke 24, verse 49, he says, don't leave Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Picking up the language of Isaiah 32. And then we see in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit poured out on the church in new and fresh ways. The fulfillment, we're told there, of Joel chapter 2. You see, it is the Spirit of God in the people of God that bears witness. That's, that's what's going on in verses, uh, in, in this context. I will pour water on the thirsty ground. I'll pour my Spirit upon your offspring. And they will spring up as, as grass among the streams, saying, I am the Lord's, calling on the name of Jacob, writing on their hand, I am the Lord's, and naming themselves by the name of Israel. It is as the Spirit is poured out on God's people, as God's people are living in accord with the Holy Spirit, that they then not only own up to their own being brought into the family of God, but they, make, they, they speak of that to others. They bear witness. These promises of future grace are profoundly comforting. It is deeply comforting from, yes, a, a parental perspective as a parent of children, but it is also deeply comforting when we think about the family of faith. Isaiah's audience, often exile in Babylon, what will come of our faith? What's going to happen to this, uh, to this, the faith of our fathers? There's lots of understandable anxiety for them. There's lots of understandable anxiety for us. <laughs> Exile is not a bad way to refer to the church in the world today. We are in the world, but we're not of it. They were in Babylon, but they weren't Babylonians. How are they supposed to live and interact in a place where it's not really their home? How are we supposed to live and act in a place that isn't really our home? Exile is not a bad way to understand our role and place in the world. And so these promises of God to us, to his people here in exile, need to come home to us maybe in fresh ways. God has purposes for his people, so we need not be afraid. God gives his spirit to his people and their descendants, so we need not be afraid. God is reassuring us that he's got it. There will be many who come to know me, who willingly call me Lord. He's got it. You see, God is more concerned about his glory than we are. He's more concerned that the nations come to know him than we are. He's more concerned that his name be honored and glorified in this world than we are. He's got this. Back in chapter 43, verse 10, we saw something of a purpose statement. 
There God says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. And then that becomes not only a promise for the, the present generation, but that present generation, the promise for that present generation gets fulfilled even here in 44 verse 5, when it's not only us who are to know the Lord and, and believe and understand that he is the God of all things, but we see that our descendants will also. Our knowing and understanding and believing becomes in time, by the grace of God, another generation knowing and understanding and believing. From one generation to the next, God's purposes stand firm and his spirit is poured out. So don't be afraid. I have my purposes, says the Lord, and I will give you and your descendants my spirit. And just in case we're prone to forget with whom it is we have to do, God supplies further comfort to us with verses 6 through 8. Just reminding us who he is. Reminding us once again of the God who makes such promises. The Lord, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping, always faithful God. The Lord, the king of Israel. Just so you remember, that guy in Babylon that calls himself king, he ain't the king. He's not your king. The Lord is our king. And he's our redeemer. He's the one who has bought us back. He's the one who's paid the price. Who has ransomed us. We are his. The Lord of hosts. Yahweh Sabaoth. The Lord of hosts. This is the God with whom we have to do. Verse 6 continues. I am the first and the last. That is to say, before y'all ever were, I was. And when y'all are long gone, I will still be. I am the first and the last. We, it's so easy for us to get caught up in our moment, in our day, and think that right now is all that ever has been. No. Not the first generation of people we are. Not the first pandemic that the world has experienced. Not the first season of uncertainty and difficulty that, that humanity's been through and that God has seen his people through. We've got to remember that kind of historical context. And the Lord helps us with that. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who's like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Again, fear not, verse 8, nor be afraid. You are my witnesses. There's no God besides me, no rock. I know not any. This is the Lord, the God of hosts, with whom we have to do. This should lead us to being comforted by who he is and what he promises to do. Even maybe being overwhelmed with who he is, his power, his sufficiency, his beauty. Fear not, beloved, the Lord says. And so that's one of the main takeaways that we ought to be impressed with from this text. The Lord certainly wanted us and his people to be impressed with. Fear not, you see it in verse 2 and again in verse 8. It is one of the chief concerns of God to communicate here to his people. Don't be afraid. There's a lot in your day that could cause you to stay up at night. There's a lot that could cause you to worry and fret and give you great anxiety. But remember who I am, the Lord says. Remember what I have done. God's spirit is with all who believe. So if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you trust that God's word is true... If you've submitted yourself to his reign and his lordship, you have God's spirit living in you. Fear not. The one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. You've been united to the God who made all things. And there is nothing that can separate you from his love. 
It is the Spirit of God who empowers, enables, supplies, giving both his gifts to his people that we might walk in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Galatians chapter 5, right? But he also gives particular spiritual gifts, as it were, not just fruit generally and in the lives of all his people, but particular gifts to particular people that they might have a unique role in his kingdom, loving the, the family of faith and serving those outside it. The Spirit of God is present in all who know Christ by faith. And with the Spirit of God present in you, God says, you are my witnesses. It is ours then to testify to this great God. One brief commentary on the word witnesses here says, God's people exist to be living proof of his all-sufficiency. Living proof of God's all-sufficiency. What if that's how we thought about ourselves in our role in this world? To be living proof of God's all-sufficiency. I would challenge the way that we think about uh, the things, the, our lives, the things that we pursue, the way we interact with other people, so that with our words, our deeds, and our tone, we might demonstrate the all-sufficiency of the God who has saved us. So, beloved, don't be afraid. God is not done with us. He's not done with you. He is present with you and in you, even as you enter or re-enter whatever difficult or uncharted territory you're in. He's with you there. Fear not. And he promises to be with you there. Fear not. In Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, faith is our response, not fear. But secondly, and lastly, lastly by way of brief application of Isaiah 44, what a great comfort this passage is about the future. What a great comfort this passage is about the future. There's so much uncertainty, so much anxiety, so much fear. But here we have beautiful covenant promises grounded in the character of God. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. God's purposes are not thwarted in your life or in the generations that come from you or the generations that follow us. Now, as I mentioned before, our primary concern as believers is the covenant family, not the biological one or the nuclear one. Because in Christ, our primary and our fundamental identity is as part of God's family. All other identities are secondary at best. So nationality, ethnicity, rank, all these other things are at best secondary identifiers. They are not what fundamentally and primarily identifies us. My last name has history to it, and, and, but that's secondary at best. These things still matter, but they are not what primarily grounds us and roots us. So in Christ, we can have this assurance about the future of God's people. That the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. There's a lot of fear going around in our culture about the future of the church. Jesus wins. We don't need to fret. We don't need to be afraid. Yes, we need to be careful and thoughtful and ground what we believe and think in the scriptures. Yes and amen. And we can't do that in a spirit of fear. So let us remind ourselves of what is true, who God is, what he's done, what he's promising yet to do. And let us be not afraid about the future. And yes, there are applications here for those of us that are parents or grandparents. Within the covenant family, God's grace tends to flow downhill. So we can be confident before the Lord, believing this, these promises. 
that though we see it not now, God will pour out his spirit on our offspring. We would do well to fight to believe this promise more than we fret over the state of our children. It is the Lord's to save and redeem. It is the Lord's to pour out his spirit. And so he promises to do in Acts chapter 2, where he tells us this promise is for you and for your children. For any that are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. What a great comfort we have here about the future. Both our own children as we trust in Christ and the future of the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And while we can't see the future, God does. And he's actually planned it. And it's all for his glory. So beloved, fear not. The Lord is God. He is our rock and will be the rock for generations to come. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, please do protect us from fear. There is much of which we could be afraid and wrestle even with fear. Maybe even this morning, thinking about our own children or grandchildren or the state of the church and what's going to come of Uh, of the church, either this particular church or a denomination or the church in this country around the world. There are many anxieties that we could have. Father, even as we seek to think through those issues well, ground us in who you are so that we might be tethered to the truth and free from fear by the power of your spirit. Amen. Over the course of this year, we've been using the New City Catechism one question a week to help teach us about the foundational truths of the gospel. And we're at question 51 because there's only one Sunday left in the calendar year. So we'll use New City Catechism question 51 as a confession of faith with a number of scripture passages related to it. Uh, Responsively, we'll read these together and then we'll sing... uh, It's a Charles Wesley hymn, Arise, My Soul, Arise, encouraging us to see Jesus as the one who is before the throne in our behalf so that we can be free from fear, confident in who the Lord is and what he's done. So if you're able, let's stand together by way of response. We'll confess our faith and then sing to ourselves and to one another. Beloved, I ask you of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension? Christ physically ascended on our behalf, just as he came down to earth physically on our account. And he is now advocating for us in the presence of his Father, preparing a place for us and also sends us his Spirit. He is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off your guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice on my behalf appears. 
Before the throne my surety stands. Before my throne my surety stands. My name is written on his hand. Ever lives above for me to intercede. His all redeeming love, his precious blood to me. His blood atoned for every race. His blood atoned for every race. And sprinkles now the throne of grace. My bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers, they strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh forgive, they cry. Forgive him, oh forgive, they cry. Nor let the ransom sinner die. The Father hears him pray, his dear anointed one. He cannot turn away the presence of his Son. The Spirit answers with the blood. The Spirit answers with the blood and tells me I am born of God. My God is reconciled, His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for His child, I can no longer fear. With confidence I now draw nigh, with confidence I now draw nigh, and Father Abba, Father cry. As people said together, you may be seated. It's a fair question to ask, how can I know? <laughs> how can I know that what I've just sung or what I've heard other people sing is true? And God in his grace gives us a simple reminder, bread and wine. Because we're quick to forget and the fears are quick to rush in and cause us to be tempted to unbelieve. God says, remember, remember, remember who I am and remember what I've done for you because I love you. And the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, <clears throat> he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so with these two simple things, bread and wine, the Lord gives to us a reminder, not only of our need for him and our ongoing need at that, but of his supply, his provision and abundant at that. So for those of you that know Christ by faith and are seeking to honor him with your life, this is for you. One more reminder of God's grace to you in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us Jesus. And you've given us of your spirit to apply what Jesus has done to our account. And so now further that work in our own hearts that we might better demonstrate you as your witnesses in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. One word of caution for those of you that don't know Christ or are not living uh, in accordance with that faith. This is a family meal. It's for those that have taken the name Christ to themselves. So if you don't know Christ or living out of, uh, out of accord with that faith, I'd encourage you on the authority of the scriptures to let this meal pass you by. Remain in your seat, even as others grab the supplies from the tables and 
Ask the Lord to be at work in your life. Help you to see Jesus. I'll certainly be praying that way for you. For those of you that will be receiving the elements this morning, you can head to one of these tables. I'd ask that you uh, wear your mask while you're moving about the sanctuary. Once everyone's received the elements, we'll take the, the bread and juice together in a few moments. So please, as you're prepared, go collect your communion supplies. <clears throat> Beloved, as we access the bread together, this bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ broken for you? Taste and see. So too, this cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Taste and see. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for our Savior. We thank you for your abundant grace to us in him, applied to us by your Spirit. Use these common and simple elements by the power of your Spirit to make us more like Jesus, that you might be praised in this world, even through us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Recognizing the time, there are going to be some other folks coming in very soon. We're going to skip that last song there, Psalm 2. I'd commend it to your uh, reading uh, and your own worship. But let's close our service with the doxology. Let's stand together and we'll sing together the doxology as we close. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and forevermore through Jesus, our King and our Savior, and God's people said together, amen. amen.